morning, everyone. Hello, I am Marjorie Schuster, and I am the coordinator of literary events here at Temple Emanuel. And welcome to the second session of this year's Women on the Move author series. In this series, we talk to female writers and they tell us all about their careers, their lives, their choices, and their latest books. And it's always so exciting to meet with them. First of all, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Samuel I. Newhouse Foundation for their support. Today, I am thrilled to welcome and to also to meet Janine Cummings, author of one of the most popular books in the last year and one of the most controversial. American Dirt tells the timely story of immigrants and there is much to discuss on this topic. As always, Zibby Owens, creator of the podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books and published author, as of just last week, is our moderator. Please type your questions in the chat feature of Zoom and I will read them to Janine in the last 15 minutes. Welcome, Janine. Welcome, Zibby. Thank you. Hi. So Hi. happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Thanks for letting me moderate. <laughs> nice to see you. Hi, Janine. Hi, Zibby. How are you? I'm good. It's so great to see you. Me I too. wish we could do this in person, but this is the next best thing, right? Me too. It would be nice to do anything in person. I know. Um, <laughs> but for getting there. Yeah, soon. Maybe next year. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. I just, I, I'm so distracted by the beautiful bookshelf behind you and the way that it's color coordinated. I did that on Saturday morning. That's I have amazing. to say. Yes. I, I need to change my bookshelves. Now. <laughs> I actually, I know I told you this, I'm just getting over COVID and I was in bed for nine straight days. And on the 10th morning I woke up and I was like, oh my gosh, I have energy again. And I came in here and I took every book off of every shelf and was like, I'm making a new bookshelf. So that was my burst of energy. Um, <laughs> very expenditure of your time. Right? Yes. Anyway. Um, well, I love books and I particularly have loved your book, American Dirt, which I'm sure everybody on this Zoom has heard of and hopefully by this point has read. And if they haven't already, now's the time uh, to, to read this book. Um, yes, there has been a lot of controversy around it. However, it it is one of the best books I've ever read. And I say this to anybody who ever asks. <laughs> um, so congratulations on writing what has become one of the greatest masterpieces of, of this time. And I, I don't say this to butter you up. I actually really, really mean it. It's, it's amazing. So thank you. Congratulations. Thank you for being so kind. It's, um, you know, it was a labor of love five years in the making and it's really gratifying to know that despite all the controversy, readers like you have responded so positively to the book that it, it, um, it really makes a big difference. It feels like the antidote in a lot of ways to the difficulty of the last year. So I, I'm grateful. So let's talk about the book itself for a little bit, because the book itself is fantastic, as I said, but also weaves in so many different themes, right? We have the theme of motherhood because Lydia, and for those of you who aren't following, well, I'm assuming most people have read it, but Lydia and Luca have to try to get out of Mexico and um, after a horrific opening scene, which is one for the ages. And a lot of it has to do with the fierce love that a mother has for her son and what she'll do to protect her son. And then of course there are th layers and layers of themes on top of that, but let's start with like the motherhood piece and yeah. you're writing that relationship. Tell me a little bit about how you structured their relationship and what tools you use to really show this love and what a mother wouldn't do. Yeah. Well, I love that. That's the first thing that we talk about because you know, that is the engine of the book for me. And it, and in fact, I think it's probably the engine of most of my writing. Um, certainly, I think all my novels are about the bonds between parents and their children. And I, you know, I, I think that one thing about this novel, it's funny, given everything that happened, but I never thought of this as a Mexican story. I, um, you know, I, I, I wrote two failed drafts of this novel, neither of which was set in Mexico before I wrote this one. And it's true that most of the characters in this book are Mexican and Central American, but um, kind of the whole point of the novel for me is that, in fact, they could be anyone. They could be 
from Syria or Afghanistan or, um, you know, Houston, Texas at this point. It's what would you do if you're a mother and you live in a place that begins to collapse around you? To what lengths will you go to save your child? And I would argue that the answer to that question crosses every cultural boundary there is. You know, the answer is anything. You would do anything. And, um, you know, this is one of the few absolutely universal truths, I think, of humanity is that we do whatever it takes to save our children. And, um, you know, when I was writing this book, I was grieving for my father. Um, and I think that a lot of that grief and the trauma of losing him in the way that I did is evident in the book it's it's evident to me reading it um and I think you know very often when I have a trauma in my life it makes its way into the pages and that is one way that I have of of um you know it's like therapy it's like free therapy writing a novel but <laughs> it's also um you know what I tell my children is that if you can take your deepest pain your deepest wound in the world and embrace it and live in it, sink into it and, and get to know it and, and do whatever it, you can do with it until you find a way to make it into something beautiful. I think that is the greatest, you know, endeavor that we can hope for as human beings. So as a writer, that's always what I want to do is to take that kind of pain or trauma and find a way to, to use it um, in, in the story in a way that, that makes the story more meaningful. And you started with a memoir, or that was one of your first works, is when you recounted the horrific events that befell, is that a word, befell, that had befallen your family, that happened to your family, yes. um, your cousins who were, I mean, I can, it can barely even say it, raped and murdered, your brother narrowly escapes. How did you cope with that whole situation? I know you made it into a memoir, um, yeah. but when you, when you start writing from a place like that, you can't just you know, move on to like romance. Do you know what I mean? Like you're, you're no. still like deep, you know? So tell me a little bit about starting there and how that led you to the kind of writing you're doing now in fiction. Yeah. So the incident that happened with my family, um, it happened when I was 16 years old and, you know, we were, you, you kind of, you did the, the um, thumbnail version of it there. It's, I mean, that's everything people need to know. We were on vacation um, visiting family and my brother and cousins went out one night and they were attacked by four strangers and the two girls never made it home. And, um, you know, when you're 16 and that happens to your family, um, it was the single most formative experience of my life. And so it's impossible for me to know how I would be different as a writer or a person as a person, you know, if that hadn't happened. Um, but to be sure, I can draw bright lines from that experience um, to American dirt, you know. I've always been someone who's interested in in writing stories from the less represented point of view. So, you know, I feel like if you look at true crime, for example, most of those stories are focused um, on the murderers, on the perpetrators of violence. And it's for good reason, you know, that's where the story is. The victims having been murdered are no longer around to tell their story. So the action is like hunting down and finding the murderer and figuring out what makes that person tick and all of that stuff. Um, it's always been less interesting to me. You know, I think because of that experience in my early life that I, I've always felt a sort of silent outrage. Like, why are we focusing on the violent perpetrators? Why aren't we telling these stories from the points of view of the people who have suffered and endured. Um, and so that was absolutely my driving force, but behind writing A Rip in Heaven, which was the memoir. 
And I think it has trickled into every book I've written since. And to be sure, it's it's a very strong theme in American Dirt. You know, if you turn on Netflix, you're going to find two dozen different iterations of stories about violent men in Mexico. It's always a man with a gun at the center of that story, whether he is law enforcement or a narcotraficante almost doesn't matter because he's a guy with a gun who shoots people. Um, and you know, there, there are very few stories about the women and children on the flip side of that violence. So I feel like this has always sort of been my, um, my calling card as a writer is to follow that less, um, less well-represented story. Do you ever feel like maybe, I think Soledad and Rebecca on in this book are your cousins sort of reimagined in a way that this is them trying to escape the situation that they weren't able to in real life? Yeah, I mean, it's not something I was cognizant of in my own psychology when I was writing it, but um, several people have asked me that question since, and it seems inescapably true at this point. Um, I think so. I think that the, the birth of those two characters in my mind probably came from that latent place of grieving for those beautiful girls. Do you mind if I read just like two paragraphs um, about them? And yeah, uh, you um, if you don't mind, this will be short, just like three paragraphs. Um, and this is when they're on La Bestia or the Bestia or whatever, um, when they're trying to escape and they have met this whole band of characters along the way. And well, I'll just read it. What happened? Sully Dot asks. There's still a lot of yelling coming from the car, two ahead of theirs, and a couple of voices begin to emerge from the fray louder than the others. One man is welling, Hermano, Hermano, Hermano. And then he stands up on the train and his companions grab him and pull him back down. And then a moment later, the scene repeats itself. He seems determined to jump off. And now the story is traveling back along the train until it gets to the cluster of men seated in front of the sisters. One young man turns to share it. His brother fell off. Soledad gasps and crosses herself. Dios mio, how, she asks. The man points back at the tunnel they just passed through. Didn't see the tunnel. Was sitting up too tall on his knees and bang, he hit his head on the top of the tunnel and got knocked right off. Soledad's face is a twist of horrified compassion. She leans past the young man because she can see now beyond him that the wailing brother is back on his feet a third time. The words fly out of her mouth by instinct. Her hand darts toward him. Stop him, she screams. Grab him. But it's too late. The man has jumped. He's a distorted silhouette of arched arms and legs against the bleary yellow of the late morning sky. His shadow makes the shape of grief as he hurtles toward the earth. Too far, it's too far. Soledad's voice is slowly, is still working independently of her body. Oh my God, oh my God. Their train car is already passing where the jumper has landed. His body rolls down the steep embankment and away. Luca counts his arms and legs. One, two, three, four. He counts them again to make sure. He still has all four, but they don't seem to be working. His body comes to a stop in a thicket of weeds, and the train storms on without him, without his brother. Soledad is almost catatonic after watching the man jump, as if the incident loosened the fragile scab of her own suffering. She lies down again, and Rebecca pulls her sister's head into her lap. She strokes Soledad's long black hair back away from her forehead and quietly sings a song in a language Lydia has never heard before. Soledad stays there unblinking, but soon her expression softens, her dark eyebrows turn slack, and her lids flutter closed. She drifts into some state akin to sleep. Oh, you're so good. I mean, first of all, the immediacy of that scene, like I don't, I challenge anyone to feel like they were not just sitting up there and that fear and that, oh my gosh, just all the emotion. So when you're writing a scene like this, tell me about it. Do you sit there and like sort of imagine it visually? Do you like, how do you recreate a scene like this? Tell me your, what are your tricks? Oh gosh, um, that's a great question. And it's, um, it's, I guess it's it, probably just saying like, oh, it's magic and I can't describe it is <laughs> probably not helpful. Um, but there is something that happens, I think when I'm writing where it, it, the story is moving a bit beyond me and I'm not always self-aware in the moment of how it's happening or how I'm writing. I think for me, a very, very significant part of the process is research. And this is true even when I'm writing a book um, that's set you know, in this room. Um, 
I need to immerse my imagination in that place. So I need to go there. I have to be, you know, I, I, I spent a lot of time doing research in Mexico. I visited migrant shelters and orphanages and I, I volunteered at a desayunador and um, I spent a lot of time with migrants and listened to their stories. But also I think there's something about being in the place that you're writing about um, that is almost impossible to recreate um, because you have to engage all five senses, I think. So, I mean, you can research, like you can watch YouTube videos and whatever, but you won't know what a place smells like unless you go there. Um, so, you know, I think for me that is essential. And even when I've been to a place, when I'm then writing the scene, which might be weeks later, I always will go back to the camera roll and open those photographs that I took when I was there to try to trigger the sensory memory of being in that, in that space. And I think that kind of immersive experience is essential for me as a writer. I know everyone's process is different, but for me, that's what it looks like, you know? You should take some of those pictures and like post them up somewhere. Yeah. You know, like yeah. this is what, this is what I was trying to channel, you know, we could, yeah. we could let you know how you did. <laughs> yeah. That's a good idea. I have one. Oh, show us. Yeah. Yeah. I have one tacked up here on my wall. That's, um, this was when I was in Tijuana, there's, um, there's a, a sign or a, you know, a hand painted thing on the fence on the border wall in Tijuana that says, también de este lado hay sueños. It's, on this side too, there are dreams. And um, to me that felt so, um, it's, I mean, it was such a shocking and, you know, like a startling reminder of like how proprietary we have become in this country about everything. <laughs> and um, in this story, it really felt essential for me to remember that every single day that I was writing. Wow. And of course, the migrant experience is something that, well, A, has gotten a lot of attention, but B, is something that is close to your heart because as you recounted in the amazing article that was just, just came out in your interview that you granted to the London Times on the occasion of your UK version coming out, um, your own husband is an immigrant from Ireland. Um, yeah. And while it doesn't matter where you come from, your point is sort of, well, when you live with someone who's like the centerpiece of your life, who at any moment could be ripped away from you and deported. And that's a different, it's a fragile sort of foundation on which to rest your life and love. Um, tell me a little bit about that feeling and then how you put that in American dirt. Yeah. You know, it's, it's an objectively terrifying way to live. It's, I just, no matter what. And I wrote a, an essay many months ago for one of the Irish newspapers. It was maybe the Irish Times um, or the Examiner about, you know, the kind of moments when I realized that we were never the undocumented family they were looking for. Um, you know, the privilege of being a native English speaker, of having an Irish face and an Irish accent. And, you know, his journey was that he flew into JFK and then like waited at baggage carousel three for his luggage, you know, he didn't have to um, endure any kind of hardship on his journey. But when he got to this country, he, you know, it was, he was on a visitor visa, which is the same way that I think between 60 and 70% of undocumented Americans come here. They, they come, you know, on a visitor visa, they're not making the journey on La Bestia from Central America. They're flying in from where, wherever their country of origin is and they're coming here to visit and then they overstay their visa. And that is the way the majority of undocumented people in this country um, get here, contrary to popular belief. But you know, that's that was the story of his journey. But once he got here and he overstayed the visa, he got like a summer job, which then he turned out to be really good at. And then he he overstayed and the whole time they were trying to sponsor him. So they were doing the thing where they were attempting to adjust his paperwork to get him the proper visas and it, it didn't work. They tried for years. 
Um, and then, you know, maybe two years into that process, he met me and I sunk my hooks into him and, um, <laughs> you know, we, we fell in love and he, he waited a long time to propose partly because he was determined to ratify his, his status before he proposed. He didn't want this idea looming over us that, you know, that he had married me for the green card, which was never a fear, I think for either of us, but, but he just wanted it done before. And it just, it turned out to be impossible. We, he did everything that he could. Um, and I think in the 10 or more years that we were living in that way, and with all the extra fear of, you know, every morning when he leaves the house is, is he going to come home again? Um, you know, and I have a brother who's a firefighter. So that is a fear that is not unfamiliar to me, that idea that like, you know, anything could happen to anyone at any time. So, but there isn't, it's, it's extra heightened when you're living with someone who's undocumented. And then, you know, eventually when we got married, it took an additional two and a half years to get his green card after we were married. Um, and the whole time you're in that holding pattern, you can't travel. You um, will call the system to try to get an update on the status and the automated system like mocks you. It's like, thank you for calling. Your status is in um, under review. Please call back in 90 days. And it's like, and it just does that for three years until one day you walk to the mailbox and there's an envelope in there that you're lucky you didn't toss out with the junk mail. And it's like the green card, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, so, it's crazy how opaque and broken our immigration system is. Um, and we lived with that for many years. And, and you know, he actually even fell out of status briefly um, just a few years ago when he went to get a citizenship. We applied for the citizenship and it took so long um, that his green card expired while we were waiting to hear back from about the citizenship and it was I think another two and a half or three years that we were waiting and um the lawyers advised us during that time not to renew the green card because then the green card would have superseded the citizenship application so he just became undocumented again this is 10 years into our marriage two kids a house and a dog later you know and all it takes is like one overzealous police officer to pull him over and he's gone and it's just, it, it's crazy that how many families are having to navigate that. And then with the additional layer for so many people of racism, institutionalized racism in this country, the hurdles of not being able to speak the language um, and all the other problems of potentially not having a safe place to return to if they do get deported. Um, so there's just layer upon layer upon layer of, of problems in this system that frankly would be relatively easy to address and fix if we could find the political will in this country to do that. Well, I feel like American Dirt put a face by having Lydia and Luca go through this experience, put a, a real, like it was as if a, a close friend had told me what the journey was like by reading your book. So I felt like I not, you know, that's the, the power of great narrative, right? Great literature is you actually feel like you've experienced some of these things. And then I can read subsequent books, but I feel like your book changed the way I think about the whole immigration experience. I just, I read recently, um, I don't know if you've read yet, Patricia Engel's new book called Infinite Country. And they're, they, it was, it's it's a, in similar themes, but they're coming from Colombia. Um, and you find yourself at times like reading, like, well, maybe you should just go back. Like, what are you, like, it, it's not so great here. Cause I don't know. It's just, um, I feel like you have started this dialogue in a very, very important way. And that's, I mean, obviously it was there, but for, so with your 1.5 million copies or whatever is out there, you have, opened this dialogue, which now can be addressed and cannot be ignored um, for so many. I mean, it's always my great, it's, I think it's probably every writer's great hope, but for me, you know, I grew up reading books like Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, um, which 
blew my mind as a sixth grader. And those were always the kind of books that I wanted to write books that would absolutely do what you just described, which is like make people think differently about something that perhaps their mind wasn't open to before. Um, that's always my greatest hope. So it makes me happy to feel, to know that it, oh, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry was assigned summer reading for my school, yeah. like our mandatory book. So yeah. I, re- I literally remember like sitting on a beach reading that like a hundred years ago when I was like in sixth grade or whatever, yeah. not a hundred, but it's you know. Great book. <laughs> Absolutely astonishing book. Um, let's talk just like for two seconds about the fact that this became such a big scandal. And in the London Times um, piece, you talk about the fact that you stayed at home in your bathrobe and ate nachos for months after and a friend had to move in and, you know, make sure you were okay because of all the PTSD. Tell me a little about this unexpected backlash when when the book had been, you know, won at auction by, um, I, who was it? Grant? No, it's, how do I know? Flat Flat iron. Iron, right? But, but, yeah. And uh, it, it was chosen by Oprah and was going to be this whole thing. And I'm sure you were just like, how could you not have been just riding high on like the imminent success? And then right before you were at the finish line, ha- had this complete reversal, yeah. which, oh my, and then, and then to have the tour canceled and, you know, the rumors of death threats and all this stuff. Take us just back to that nacho eating moment for a minute. <laughs> I try to stay away from that moment. Um, It was bad. It was really, really painful. And, you know, I, I am not a victim. I don't ever want to cast myself as a victim in any way. But, you know, this moment in our culture, where when we disagree with each other, instead of saying, please help me understand what we say is, you're a piece of shit, and you deserve to die. And then, you know, all of Twitter starts saying that same thing. Um, it's ugly and it can be incredibly painful to the person who is on the receiving end of it. And it's a different person every third day now at this point, you know, it's, it it is something we have to figure out how to contend with in this, in this moment in our culture. Um, And I don't know what the answer is, you know, but it was really, really bad. It was my, my husband says it was like launching a cruise ship from the top of a cliff because (laughs) it was so high, you know, like you are saying it was, I mean, the pre-publication praise for this book was like nothing I'd ever seen. And I was in publishing for 10 years. Um, It was, it was insane. It was, it was really exciting. And it, I have to say across an extremely diverse landscape of readership, including lots of Mexican and Latino writers, who were saying rhapsodic things about this novel um, until it all turned on a dime, you know, like the weekend of publication, it all, it all turned. And, you know, it was funny because I did expect some pushback way before, you know, and then when it didn't happen, when we sent out 10,000 copies of this galley and got nothing but glowing reviews for it for many months, I thought we were in the clear. And then, you know, when it all happened just the weekend before publication, it was it was intense, it was painful. Um, I think every writer is prepared to some degree to have bad reviews and to have people who hate the book. Fine, I'm cool with that. Um, but there was something new in this moment where it wasn't so much about the book as it was about me. It was about my integrity it was about my ethnicity, which is bananas, <laughs> because I happen to be Puerto Rican and Irish, but I don't, it's not relevant. I don't understand what that has to do with the novel that I wrote. Um, although I will say that I, I probably opened the door to that conversation a little bit by writing the author's note that I wrote. Um, so I think that was problematic, but Nobody, no, no fiction writer anticipates the kind of hatred that I received. Nobody. I mean, you know, I, it's not what I signed up for. It's not what I expected. And yes, the tour was canceled because of that hatred. It was canceled because there were threats of violence against me. And um, 
you know, what happened was that the events be started to be canceled piecemeal. Um, so we were hearing from uh, bookstores and venues three and four days out that they weren't going to, you know, they didn't, they could, didn't feel they could guarantee my safety. And um, so we were canceling events one at a time. And then at, eventually the publisher said, I think we need to just call it. And I was really resistant at first because I felt like I didn't want to give up. I didn't want to give in. I wanted to say what I wanted to say, you know, and I felt like I could engage. I felt like I could address all of the complaints in a way that um, because I'm, I'm open, I'm willing to, to talk and listen and learn. Um, but I, there was no, there was no dialogue happening and, and it wasn't, you know, ultimately I think they understood that it, it just was a, um, it was going to be a non, it, it wasn't, it was going to be a non-victorious, um, thing and and that it wasn't worth the the physical danger uh, to the to the bookstores the the employees of the bookstores and the venues and to myself i wonder what would have happened if the timing had been pushed just a little and this had been during covid because you wouldn't have had any threats i mean it wouldn't have mattered right if, with everything virtual i just wonder yeah. what that would have done if that if the conversations could have happened Right. Because I think part of the book tour being canceled, then you it was another silencing of sorts. Right. Unless you were going to like call it like an old school, like press conference, you know, like from the movies, like gather around. Right. Yeah. Then you didn't have as much of a venue. Um, I wonder, though, at this point, like looking back a year later or whatever, would you have done anything differently? I mean, you reference the author's note, but would you have changed things in the book? Or are you going to change things in any subsequent editions, or or are you just like where do you where's your where's where's your head where's your head at these days? Yeah, I don't think that the book is the problem. Uh, frankly, I think that um, I I do regret the author's note. I think it was clumsy, and it was my endeavor to try to justify the book that I had written. And to be frank, like I don't owe anyone an explanation. I'm a novelist. I made up a story. And um, and I stand by the book that I wrote. I spent five years writing it. Um, I do think that the, the conversation about cultural appropriation in particular is an important one. Um, but I think there's a difference. I think we need to learn how to differentiate between what is cultural appropriation, um, what is just the stealing and hijacking of stories versus what is someone who is fully engaged in social justice and attempting to wade into a conversation that she feels is really important and she wants to be a part of? Um, you know, then there were parts of the controversy that I think are completely legitimate. You know, there are tremendous inequities in the publishing industry and Latino writers have been underrepresented and underpaid for a long time and specifically Mexican writers. And that is a thing that, you know, the publishing industry thanks in part to what happened with American Dirt is finally contending with that reality that they need to do better with representation. And, and so I think that, um, I mean, I feel glad that, that those conversations are finally happening. It was painful to be the <laughs> catalyst for them, um, you know, especially as someone who, I consider myself Latina, you know, I'm, I'm part Puerto Rican and I'm, I've always been really proud of my heritage. And um, so that it was weird. It felt really strange to be somehow held up as the poster child uh, for inequity in the publishing industry when I am, you know, a, a, I am who I am without trying to pigeonhole myself in a, in a half a sentence, but I am, I am not who, I am not the, I did not recognize myself in the outrage online. I am not who I think people wanted to believe that I was. Well, I think there's this crazy 
assumption that just because someone is a relatively public figure or writes a book or stars in a movie or whatever, that their life is sort of up for grabs for everybody else to paw into and dissect and then judge. Um, and I think people in their haste to make judgments or jump on a bandwagon or whatever, they forget that someone's on the other side of those tweets. I mean, what kind of kindness is that? I mean, you can make your point without, you know, threatening the life of somebody who, who is at their core, an artist, right? You're creating a work of art here by creating literature and starting a discourse. And, um, you know, I wrote this at the time when I wrote this piece in defense of Janine Cummins, <laughs> because I was so, um, I was so upset because I had like the special place in my heart for your book. I kept like telling everybody before I came out, like, oh my God, it's amazing. And then I, I was like, I couldn't believe what, what happened. And I was trying to defend a novelist's right to paint a picture. And obviously there are many other layers to it, but still, can we not try to write about a culture whether or not we inhabit it? Um, it doesn't mean other people shouldn't write it. I mean, I don't know. Um, but uh, for people like tweeting and tagging people on tweets and all this stuff, you know, this goes back to just why, why be so mean? I don't know. I guess like, I don't yeah. know. I just, sometimes I don't understand this sort of hate culture of hatred and cancellation and all of the stuff, but maybe that's off topic. I mean, look, I don't, it, it's so easy to, to go into that rabbit hole and we could talk about it for days, but I should just say I've spent an inordinate amount of time thinking about it this year. And just even the phrase cancel culture, I think it bothers me. I don't use it because it's a, it feels like a cop out on both ends. It's like, it, 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 it allows people who aren't, who don't want to be engaged with social justice or racial justice, it allows those people the opportunity to be dismissive, right? And say like, oh, it's just cancel culture, it's whatever. But on, at the same time, it also allows people who are really just engaged in hateful vitriol and often, you know, some, many of these people in a self-serving way, um, it allows them the opportunity to sort of wrap themselves in the banner of moral outrage when really like we should just call a spade a spade. And there are plenty of folks out there who are just engaged in hatred for hatred's sake. And it has nothing to do with, with you know, racial justice or social justice. Um, so I think it's a little reductive, this whole conversation, and and it would be great if we could dig into it and figure it out, like with a bit more nuance, you know. Okay, well, not today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what uh, what are you working on now? Well, I have finally started my new book. Um, I mean, really recently, like last Saturday. You know, I've I have sort of thought of and discarded a dozen ideas over the last year about, um, you know, all the themes that that have been running through my head all year and I couldn't find a good framework on which to hang them. And then I think I finally hit on it. So I've been talking to my agent and my editor. It's sort of top secret for now, but, um, but it feels so good to be writing again. I, I worried that I would be um, a little cowed, you know, I wanted to wait as until I felt like I could be sure that I would write without censoring myself, that I wouldn't be writing into my fear. And I'm finally at that place. It's been a year. I think I have some good um, perspective about what happened with this book. And I know in the end of the, at the end of the day, I'm stronger because of it, you know, and maybe slightly more liberated actually, you know, because I think a lot of writers in this, in this sort of cultural landscape are maybe fearful. I would be, I think, you know, of like trying to be free to write whatever they want because they may be weighing the potential cost if Twitter decides that what they've written is wrong for some reason. Um, so they may be weighing that relatively heavily into their decisions about how they write and what they write. With me, I sort of feel like maybe I am just completely liberated because I I already went through it and I survived. So um, maybe now that means I'm free to write whatever book I want. 
It's it, it like ties back to where this all started, right? When you start your life with the worst thing ever happening, you have to build things from there, right? The worst has happened. The worst happened to your family, like something unthinkable and terrible. And yet you recovered and you realized you could go on. And now the same type of thing is like trauma essentially has happened with your book. And now like maybe it's all just destined like this next book maybe this is going to be the like the I don't even know right all these things have conspired so um I don't know it's it's... anytime you have a hardship in your life as a writer if you can take that and fold it into yourself and find a way to not be defeated by it but to to fold it into your work somehow that it can inform your work it gives you greater perspective it can make you a better writer so that is that is my hope we'll see we'll see (laughs) and is this where you write like where you are right now yeah, this is my office. It's um, away from the house. So thank God. Uh, so we have a detached garage and my office is above the garage. So I have to climb a ladder to get up here, but um, it's cozy and I cannot hear the homeschooling that's happening 30 feet away. So <laughs> it's good. Yeah. Wow. And that's why that's why all the FaceTimes, I guess. <laughs> um, our daughters both FaceTime us quite often, um, age 13. This is like, I don't, I don't know what I used to do to my mom, but I guess this is the equivalent of that kind of bothering of the mother. So <laughs> yeah. And I decline, decline, decline. She can come climb the ladder and knock on the latch if she needs me. <laughs> wow. I need more of an obstacle to get into my office. I have just like a tiny hallway in Manhattan. To, well, not so tiny, but it's right there. So, um, you know, Perhaps a ladder, maybe some sort of um, one of those things you put on the ground, like from a gym class, you know, those like um, the yellow thing. Anyway, whatever. Um, (laughs) uh, Do you have any like inspiring type advice for the many people out there trying to write this great American novel? Yes, they should read this book. (laughs) Have Time To by Zibby Owens. It's a great book. (laughs) <laughs> my advice actually this is my advice right read 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 I think that is the most important thing you can do as a writer it makes you better absolutely makes you better read as a writer try to figure out the books you love why do you love them what did the writer do in those books pay attention to the craft um, I have found at this point that when I am r- reading a book that I absolutely love that is the only time I'm not paying attention to the craft and then if it's almost flawless you know and then you have to go back and read it again and figure out like why was it so good what did they do what were their tricks you know because I think the craft is really visible um, in books that are like the three and four star books that you really enjoy but you don't you're not rapturous about them right Um, you can see why and so I think all of that kind of reading is, is huge. It's crucial to being a good writer. Thank you. All right. I see Marjorie. So this means it must be question time. It is question time from everybody who was watching. First of all, Zibi and I had a wonderful conversation last week about uh, loving to meet writers and authors because as a reader, uh, an author is a rock star to me, always has been. So I'm very thrilled to meet you virtually, Janine, and to have corresponded with you. And I hope uh, we'll do this in person when the world is normal again. And your book was spectacular. Before we start, there's lots and lots of comments and everybody's happy that Zibi is feeling better. Thank you. (laughs) Lots of people. And now we'll get to the real questions. Let me just start here. Laura had a wonderful question or comment. Laura said, I love the book. Most importantly, this was a topic I knew very little about the struggle for people to give up their lives and their possessions to risk their lives and that those are their children to come to, uh, to this country was powerfully presented. Your book changed my perspective on how we as a country and people have failed to help those escaping oppression. I'd like to know how somebody could help. What, what resources do you suggest? Do you have any uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, there are so many great organizations who are doing work in the borderlands um, to support migrants. And one of them um, is the International Rescue Committee. Mm. And um, I mean, so there is actually, I have a list of organizations that I worked with when I was doing the research for this book, as well as, um, you know, I've continued to support them 
since then, since I first met with some of them, which was back in 2013 or 14. Um, and that there's that list of resources on my webpage. So if people are looking for smaller organizations where they they can really get a lot of bang for their buck, um, this is the best thing that we can do. Actually, you know, there are so many people on the ground in the borderlands who have the reach and the expertise to to help the migrants who sorely need help, and um, all they need is funds. For some reason, you know, I heard this over and over again from the organizations that are larger, more sort of multinational organizations. The same kind of programs when they're running them in different parts of the world are very well funded. Uh, but for some reason, the, the Mexico programs are, are really under-resourced. I don't know why we're so quick to support migrants, you know, on the other side of the world, but we have this kind of block when it comes to helping um, our neighbors and, and, and people who need help right here in this country. So give money. That's the first best right. thing. Linda said, did you know how American Dirt would end when you started writing it or did the plot unfold? Oh, so I wrote two failed drafts of this novel, which, um, had nothing to do with the book that you ultimately read, you know, it, uh, they were, um, completely different stories. They were kind of round robin point of view. They were both set in the borderlands and it was my endeavor to do some exploration about why the immigration system in this country is so broken uh, without, you know, without writing a book set in Mexico and it just wasn't working. So the short answer is no, I had no idea that this, how this book was going to end. I didn't even really know how it would begin mm. until three and a half years into the writing. And it was really the moment that changed everything for me was when my, my uh, it was a, a week before the 2016 presidential election. My mom and dad went out to dinner with friends one night and my, my dad died at the dinner table in the restaurant. And um, I was almost finished with my second failed draft of this novel when that happened and I was so frustrated with it. I knew it wasn't working, but I had, I had invested three and a half years um, and I didn't know what to do. And after my dad died, I was so broken. I was so traumatized by his very sudden passing um, that I, you know, I put the book away. I just hit the couch for a while. And then it was about three months later that I just dragged my laptop into bed with me one day and I wrote the opening scene for American Dirt and I had no idea where it was going. I didn't even know that I was starting over, um, but I think I knew as soon as those seven pages were down on the page in front of me that this was the book that I had been resisting for three and a half years and that it was the book my dad would be proud of. Um, so you know, from there I was off to the races. I wrote the whole book very quickly. A few weeks later, I went to the desert in Arizona. I rented a casita in the middle of, you know, out in the borderlands. Um, and I, I wrote almost half the book in 10 days. And it was during that 10 days that I could finally see the ending. I knew where I was going, um, but it all, it really happened. I had to write a lot of terrible stuff before I hit on the story. And really before I hit on the, the moment of like feeling, you know, when you're grieving, it can be like a springboard sometimes. And in that kind of moment, you have a, a new perspective on what matters to you and what doesn't matter. And what mattered to me was telling this story. How did you choose the bookstore aspect of it? Oh, you know, it wasn't, um, it wasn't, None of, you know, it's funny, whenever anybody asks me about choices that I made in the book, it always feels a little bit like I am taking credit for something that I, well, I know I wrote the book, but I'm like, <laughs> I choose, it just happens, you know, um, I did, I don't make these decisions from a place in my brain where I'm conscious of them. I wanted Lydia to have a comfortable life. I wanted her to have a really happy, comfortable life that she did not want to leave. I wanted her reasons for having to leave to be unassailable. You know, I wanted her to be a migrant of whom 
readers could not ask, why don't you just go back where you came from? Um, I wanted it to be really clear that she would like nothing more than to go back where she came from, but it's impossible for her. And, and so when I think of a really comfortable, happy life, I think of books. And so it was mm -hmm. a really organic decision that therefore she would have a life in books somehow. That was actually a very, very nice part of the book. Gwen has a question. Has this um, book been optioned for a film? Any talk of that? It's a perfect film. Thank you. It, it was optioned for a film before, um, well before the, the book ever came out, you know, several months before the book came out, they recently renewed their option. So apparently it's still in the works, but um, you know, writers have very little to do with, with, I keep saying to my husband, I'll believe that when I'm sitting in the theater eating popcorn, like it, you know, because it sold the option doesn't mean they're going to really make the film that remains to be seen. It would be a very exciting film or binge worthy Netflix show, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. I, well, thank you for saying that. It's, um, it's such a weird, it's such a weird relationship between writers and the films that are made out of their books. I think sometimes it feels like such a distant prospect. And when you hand over this, the, for me, the end goal, the end product is the book. And so a movie almost feels like its own animal. Like, it, you know, you're at that point, you're handing over creative control to someone else to make their baby. And your, your baby is just the seed for it, you know? Um, so I don't know, I don't feel that invested in it, but it is very exciting. And it would be, it would be thrilling to see what, what happens with it. You know, I, I think the guy who bought it has a great, um, earnest hope of making a good film. So It'll, it'll be interesting to see how that develops. Well, I have a question from Bonnie who wants to know a little bit about the title. <clears throat> did you <clears throat> give it the title? Yes, I did. And I had the unusual experience that this title existed in early in the process of writing the book, which is different um, from my previous books. Usually naming the book is an awful thing that happens after I've turned it in and then I have to fill up like four notebook pages of um, titles before I finally hit on one that my editor and I can agree on. Um, I, I came up with American Dirt really early in writing this book and I really liked how, how ambiguous it was. I liked that the reader would be able to project lots of their own baggage, I guess, onto that title. You know, as, um, as a person who grew up, you know, in a family that's part Puerto Rican, I've always been cognizant of the fact that elsewhere in the Americas, there is plenty of exasperation about the way that word American has been um, sort of reduced to meaning only people in the United States, when in fact there are two whole continents of peoples who are, um, you know, part of the Americas. Um, so in my mind, the whole book takes place on American dirt, and I wanted to evoke the idea that one, you know, this, this line in the sand is incredibly arbitrary. And if anyone has the hardcover edition of the book, there are the end papers inside are a borderless map. So you can really see Zibby's holding it up. Um, thank you, Zibby. You can really see that this is one land. It's one land mass and it's all the Americas. And so that was, you know, I also like the fact that the title has different meanings, you know, that it can it can sort of evoke the the dirty little secret of our terrible immigration policy, the way that we treat migrants in this country like dirt. And it's also, you know, for so many people, the destination of of hope. Thanks. Marion says, congratulations on such an engaging novel. I truly enjoyed it. Uh, did you know you were a writer as a young elementary school uh, child? No. <laughs> um, I knew that I loved to write. I didn't know anyone who was a writer or an artist of any kind. I mean, everyone in my life was an artist, but they didn't make their living that way. You know, my dad was in the Navy. My mom was a nurse. Um, my brother's a firefighter. We were, were a working class family. Um, my sister ran a soup kitchen for many years. She's on disability now, but um, we 
I didn't know anyone. I didn't know it was possible to make up stories and get paid for it. So <laughs> that came as a lovely surprise to me when I was um, a grown up that, you know, I could actually write books that people would read. And I got into the publishing industry because um, I figured it was the closest I could get and to, to working with books and to immersing myself in books all day. And I, I did that for 10 years. And that was really my greatest education was working at Penguin and, you know, seeing the quantity of books that we were publishing and then reading some of them and going, I could do this. I can do this, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I always love to write. I wrote my first book when I was six about a little girl who skateboards across America. Um, it was a real tour de force if you ask my mom, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, it's, I didn't know that I could do it like this. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling pretty lucky about now. I had an interesting comment here. Anne said, the power of the book will never leave me. I feel it should be required reading for high school students and adults. The question is, has the controversy extended beyond the US or has the value and the story of American Dirt become the true focus again? Um, it did ripple a bit, but nowhere was it like here. Um, in fact, very often when I had interviews in the foreign press, there was a lot of head scratching going on. A lot of like, please explain this to me. And it was on me actually to help to, you know, try to help people outside of this country understand that it wasn't, um, that the controversy wasn't entirely without merit. Um, you know, but the, the, the book, this just doesn't, exist in other cultures yet the way it does here. And um, so in that way, the book wasn't scrutinized as, as deeply as it was here. Um, and in fact, it, it won some international awards, which was really nice to, really nice to see. Good, I'm, I'm glad to hear about that. And I think we'll end with one or two questions and people would like to know who are your, who are your heroes in the uh, writing world? What are you reading now? That sort of thing. Yeah, I'm reading This Lie right now, which is the debut novel, and I'm enjoying it very much. Um, my heroes, I have so many. It's it's impossible to, it's such mm -hmm. a question. But I mean, Sandra Cisneros um, is incredible. Not only her talent, but her courage as a writer. Um, Anne Patchett is amazing. Mary Beth Keaton, amazing. Um, I read, I mean, look, I know I'm super late to this party, but Colson Whitehead, Nickel Boys, it's a, an astonishing book. And um, I, everyone should read that book, talk about required reading. I also, also, there's a debut novel that I read last year, which has stayed with me, Valentine by Elizabeth Wetmore. Um, what a great novel. I mean, she is, I can't believe it's a debut. She is an enormous talent and I think really one to watch as she she moves into her full force as a writer. Um, I loved um, that book, just to chime in. That was amazing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, really great book and subversive and um, just brilliant, I think. Yeah, it's still like, I wanna read it again, actually. Zippy, I know you read all the time. Is there anything you can, uh, you're reading right now that you're enjoying? Oh, well, I'm actually reading um, Kristen von Agrup's book. It's coming out in April. It's called, um, Did I Say That Out Loud? And it's all about midlife indignities. And it's <laughs> hilarious. It's like a collection of essays about all these hilarious things that she's going through in her life. She was the former editor of uh, Real Simple. Anyway, pre-order. It's so funny. I laughed out loud. It, indignities of midlife sounds terrifying, but <laughs> um, one more book I have to mention before we move off this. I, I don't know if you've read The Book of Rosie. Um, it's co-authored. Um, as far as I know, it's the only book or the first book that it's a memoir written by a mother who was separated from her children in ICE custody. And so the, the migrant woman, Rosaira Pablo Cruz, who is um, co-author of this book. I, it's astonishingly beautiful, this book, which is not what I, you know, you expect a book like this to be 
heavy and it is heavy, but her prose is gorgeous and filled with light and sweetness and love. And it just really illustrates, um, you know, what a mother will do to save her children in this situation. And um, it's, I highly recommend it for anybody who read American Dirt and is looking for, um, you know, a, a true story um, next, The Book of Rosie. All right, Thank I'm you. gonna order it right after this. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. Well, if anyone's asking me right now, I'm reading Nicole Krauss, who will be with us next week, and Joyce Carol Oates, who will be with us the week after. I believe that's March 9th, and Nicole Krauss is March 3rd, I believe. I'd have to double check the dates. Uh, I want to thank you, Janine. This was a wonderful, wonderful hour. Your um, your insights to talk to you. It's really, I, I, the comments along the line, hopefully you can read them. Um, it, it was really thrilling to hear, uh, you know, your take on the controversy and your take on this fabulous, fabulous book that you wrote. And yeah. Zibby, as always, what can I say? Um, I'm glad you're feeling better and you <clears throat> do a wonderful job. And these conversations are, are very wonderful for all of us. So much. It was okay. really enjoyable. Zibby, good to see you. And Marjorie, thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Good. All right. Bye all. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Bye.